Martin Taylor and welcome to Guitar Conversations. Wow, is this a treat sitting on the Guitar Conversations sofa with the man Don Peak. Hey, welcome Don. Hi. It's great to see you. It's lovely. It's th I'm honored that you invited me. Thank you. Oh no, it's, it's, my, it's all mine. I mean, it's just, it's so fantastic to, to meet you because I know your music so well i know you're playing so well over the years as everybody does Thank there isn't a, probably a, a a person in in the whole wide world that hasn't heard you play mm. uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm so glad to be here in in los angeles and be able to sit down and play some music and uh, and, and chat with you my pleasure so i i always i always like to ask my guests to get things get things started because i'm always curious about how everyone starts how they get started in, into playing so what was where did, where did it all begin for you well I was um, a math science major they now they call it a nerd I don't, <laughs> I don't know what they called it in those days but but I had no luck at all socially I was just maladjusted unadjusted what's the word Richard maladjusted is good okay maladjusted and and I was in high school and I had played a little clarinet I played a little piano my mother was a pianist but I was up at summer camp, I was about 16, and I was watching these guys, these three kids, and they were playing the guitar. And I was fascinated, they knew where to put their fingers. Mm. And I said, you guys are amazing. And they said, look, here's a ukulele, go out in the woods and practice. So I went out in the woods and I practiced, and then we came back to school. Well, I was in the, in the acapella choir, and they needed someone to accompany a lady named Stephanie. 
And so the choir director said, does anyone play the guitar? And I had purchased a, a little guitar and the song was Black is the Color of My True Love's Hair. Oh, yeah. Well, it's in A minor and then it has D minor and then it has E7. And I knew those chords. <laughs> and so I said, I'll play. I ended up on television playing on Spotlight on Youth, accompanying Stephanie. Well, then my cousin Richard had a friend and they had a tape recorder. This was the first tape recorder. This was 1956, 50, 57. Mm. And this young man had a group, and they were at my cousin's house. And I would go over, and it was. I'm not, I don't have the amp on. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and so I became their accompanist. Well, this man was going around telling everybody in Los Angeles he had met this wonderful guitar player, Don Peake. Well, you know, the word got around and they had me go to an audition. By this time I was advanced. By this time I could play bebop alula. It was me that had it off. And I had learned to go. And then, oh, and then the big fix. Okay, so now I'm in a line at the Ragdoll nightclub in North Hollywood. And there's a, a country singer with huge mutton chop sideburns, Jackie Lee Cochran. And he's got the shirt with the fringes, and there's a, there's a guy standing in there with a big long cigar, obviously, the promoter, George Bennett. And why I remember these things, I don't know. Anyway, I'm in line with about 30 guys. I'm out in the parking lot, the line is so long, and each guy, as they go in, they hand you a plug and you plug in, and they have you play a song. Well, it got to be my turn, and George Bennett said, can you play Bebop Alula? And I said, can I? And I went, <laughs> He said, hire this kid, hire this kid. And they hired me. And the next thing that happens, I'm on stage with the band, and Jackie Lee comes out, and we play Bebop Alula, and Jackie Lee exits, and the band looks at me, and I look at them with what we call the deer in the headlights yeah. look, when your eyes become yeah. much larger than normal. And they said, well, what do you want to play? And I said, I don't know anything else. And the whole band went, oh, my God. And they started writing charts for me, mm. and I started studying with Ray Pullman who sold me this instrument mm. in 1958. That's a beautiful guitar, by the way. What, what is it? This is a 1948 Gibson ES350 single pickup. They only made a few of them before they started making the double pickup yeah. ones. So it's a very, it's rare. Yeah, I just played that. That's. It's, why it's, why does it sound so much better when you play it? No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, I hate to say it, but it does. <laughs> anyway, so I had this guitar, and I started at LA City College. And I, and I would study math, you know, I was, had a slide yeah. rule. Do you remember a slide rule? Yeah, sure, yeah. I had a slide rule, and I did not have a pocket protector, <laughs> okay. but I did have a slide rule. And I would walk down the halls, and I'd hear the jazz band rehearsing. And I started going over and sitting in on the jazz band. Mm. And pretty soon I changed to a music major, and I started playing. And now at night, to make money, I heard about a guy named Lance. And he was Elvis's stand-in in the movies. Oh, Lance Legault. Right. Legault. He pronounced it Legault. Later on, he learned it was French. Yeah. And I would play with him at the crossbow, and, we, and he loved Ray Charles, and he made us learn exactly all the, all the Ray Charles, Hallelujah, I Love Her. So all those songs, we had to do the... You know, and so, lo and behold, Elvis would come in, and Elvis would go up in the balcony with Dorsey Burnett and Jerry Burnett, and on my break, I would go up and sit with Elvis. This was 1959. And Elvis would go, hello, Don. <laughs> and we would talk and chat. James Burton started playing with him at that point, but yeah. James was way more advanced than I was. I was just a beginner, but I was getting a reputation, which, which turned out to be a very bad thing, and I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> so now, Marshall Lieb comes into the club. Marshall from the Teddy Bears, Phil Spector, do you remember to know, know him is to love him? To know, what was it? To know, now I'll play it here. To know, know, know him right. is to love yeah, sure, Well, yeah. that was Phil Spector and the Teddy Bears. Yeah. Marshall Lee was one of the Teddy Bears. And he said, Don, listen, the Everly Brothers are looking for a guitar player. So now it was in 1961. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, they need someone that could read music and need someone who, who you know, knows the Everly songs. So I went and auditioned and they hired me. So 1961, I've been playing the guitar a couple of years and I'm on an airplane flying to England with Joey Page. Mm. And I said, Joey, man, I said, are you sure I got the job? 
<laughs> Joyce says, Don, you're on the plane. <laughs> so now we get to London and we go immediately to Trafalgar Square. They check us into the Strand Palace. Uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And that's where I met Albert Lee. And yeah. I'll tell you more about that. But anyway, I go in the Strand Palace and I'm dying because my mother was born in England in Sunderland. Mm -hmm. I'm so anxious to hear some British people speaking. And I run out of my room and I run down those big stairs and I, in the curb, in the gutter, is a Cockney couple having an argument. And the first thing I ever heard in England was, F off, f off, f off, f off. That was, that was my... So, so we started playing. The Everleys were at the height of their career, you know, and we could do the, you know... And, and I, I was lead guitar of the Everleys for three and years. And is that the shirt you wore? No, the, I bought this to play with Don Everly last year at, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They honored Don Everly. Yeah. And I decided I should have a shirt. So I got this. It looks good. I like it. Thank you. And, and they honored Don, and, and they were, Albert Lee and I were standing in the lobby, and Don Everly comes out of the elevator, and Albert goes over and hugs him. He hadn't seen him in about eight years. Yeah. I hadn't seen Don in 35 years. And Don looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, I'm Don Peake. And he said, Don Peake, he said, you were a good guitar player. I said, I still am. I'm playing for you tonight. <laughs> so we played at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You can see the video. It's, yeah. it's uh, called Don Everly and Friends. Oh, yeah, I'd like and to see that. Graham Nash is there. Yeah, I'd like to check that out. Yeah, Emmy Lou Harris. It's wonderful. I work with Albert quite oh, a lot. Oh, you know, yeah, well, so. you know. At 62, I met Albert in a club with Eric Clapton. And I invited Albert back to the Strand Palace. And he came in to my room and he looked at, at the bathtub, which was gigantic. You could swim laps in this bathtub. <laughs> and Albert said, this is bigger than my flat. <laughs> I mean, the bathroom was just enormous. Anyway, Albert and I became good friends and we still are. What a blessing he is. He's a wonderful man, yes, a wonderful he player. Yeah. He's a gypsy, did you know that? Yeah, we come from the same background. You, do you really? Yeah, we do. That's why you can do what uh, you do. I know, we have, we're... Um, oh my God. We come from the same... Uh, same ethnicity, group, ethnicity same yes. group of people, yeah. Well, you know, I have a book about the, the Czechoslovakian gypsies and all the, the European gypsies. And, We're um, Cockney gypsies. Uh, Cockney gypsies, but, but from another part of Europe, I would say. Well, we've been in England for a, in the UK for a, a long time, Yeah, a, a few, few hundred years. Right, but there's a certain magic to playing that the gypsies have, and you have it, clearly. Well... Take me hat off to you, <laughs> except I don't have a hat. So, so where, where are we? So, oh, so, we're, so we're in London, yeah. and we're playing. Now next year we come back, and now the tour has expanded, and it's the Rolling Stones, Bo Diddley, Little Richard, the Verner's Girls, Frank Ifield singing, I remember you. Yeah, so you know, I remember that guy, that. Well, how obnoxious that guy was. <laughs> and every time Don Everly got his guitar out on the bus, Frank Ifield would run up and start playing I Remember You and try to shut Don up. Oh, he was such an egomaniac. Anyway, so now we're on tour. The Rolling Stones are the backup. We're the stars. Mm. And I noticed these shaggy-haired guys standing around backstage. And I said, who are those guys? They said, those are the Beatles. They love the Everleys. Mm. Oh, and, wow. that's, and we went to the Star Club in Hamburg, and we played Rolling Stones, Beatles, Everly Brothers. And we traded sets in 1962, mm. just before the Beatles really busted out. Mm. So there I was. Don Everly got sick in 63, and we went back to Los Angeles. And so now I'm at Gold Star Studios. Jimmy Haskell is hiring me. Phil Spector is hiring me. We did. So now you really be become a studio musician. Right, right. And we started playing, you know, you, I can't sing it. Yeah. yeah. So, loving feeling. Yeah. So... I'm playing with Phil, yes, Yeah. and I walk out in the hall, and Arthur Wright, a wonderful, wonderful black guitarist, is standing in the hall talking on the only payphone, and he says, Don, take this call, and he hands me the, and I said, what is it? He said, Ray Charles is looking for a guitar player, and I said, I'm white. He said, Don, take the call. So I grabbed the phone, I said, hello, this is Don Peak." And Joe Adams says, this is Joe Adams, Brother Ray needs a guitarist. We've hired, we've gone through 35 guitar players. We can't find anyone who can read music, can play the blues, can, knows Ray's old songs, and, you know, is available to go on the road. I said, I can do that. He said, well, come on down here. So I drove down to Washington Boulevard, and there was 
a semi-round building, no windows. I thought, this must be it. Yeah. So I go in the back, and I push a button, and a buzzer sounds, a door opens, and there's a stairway. So I have this guitar, and my L5 rhythm guitar, and a little amplifier, and I'm going up the stairs. Now I get to the top, there's two doors with push bars. So I took my right foot and I kicked the door open. The door slams against the wall and facing me is the entire Ray Charles Orchestra. <laughs> in their chairs, four mm -hmm. trumpets, four trombones, five saxes, bass, Edgar Willis, drums, uh, Wilbert Hogan. Piano is empty at this point. And, and there's music. So I go over, empty chair, must be the guitar chair. Mm -hmm. And here is, is, he says, number 101. Mm -hmm. So I open up mm -hmm. the book and it's a bassy, Count Basie, fast blues, slash marks. So play with me, and we're gonna play a fast blues and F, and I'll show you what, what they did. Okay, so, one, two, oh, one, two, three. <laughs> Cooper, the baritone player, leans over to one of the Raylettes and says, that boy is serious. <laughs> yeah. So now Ray comes in, and we played a couple songs, and Ray says, I want to hire you. And I, being the fool that I am, I have this disease okay, called foot-in-mouth disease, where you <laughs> put your foot in your mouth. And I said to Joe Adams, well, how much does it pay? Joe Adams said, well, it pays $200 a week. And I said, well, Mr. Adams, I just got off the road with the Everly Brothers, and they pay 225 he says, well, I have to talk to Mr. Charles. I said, okay. And I left. And as I'm going down the stairs, I'm thinking, what did I just do? Mm. What, did, I just, <laughs> what, did I just turn down Ray Charles? <laughs> so I get to my house. My mother comes out says, Joe Adams called. It's cool. They're going to pay you a separate envelope with 25 so the rest of the band doesn't know that you're getting more than 200 Oh. So we went on the road. And we played... Uh, you know, all these play, terrible places. There's a thing that the black musicians call the chitlin circuit. Yes, yeah. Chitlin is a terrible dish made of the, the innards of pigs. Yeah. And, or cows, I don't know. Anyway, so now here I was with the Everleys going through the South. Everybody loves me. I come yeah. back with Ray Charles. I'm the only white guy in the Ray Charles band. And it's a whole different animal. And uh, I almost got... It's a long story. I'll make it really short. Governor Wallace, in 1964, declared segregation now, segregation forever. And two young people, two young black people tried to get into the college. And Governor Wallace stood in the door and wouldn't let them in. That's very, I've seen, yeah. You've seen the famous. footage? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, what you don't know about the footage is that the Attorney General of Alabama came to Governor Wallace on the film and said, Governor Wallace, it's the federal law, it's the national law, it's the law of the nation. Governor Wallace said, I don't care. So the Attorney General said, excuse me, and he left Suddenly, there were tanks coming up and trucks full of National Guardsmen. And the general got out and he walked up that path and he saluted. And he said, Governor Wallace, please step aside. And he did. But what we don't, what nobody knows is the Attorney General called Washington and spoke to John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy activated the National Guard. I so see. now here we are, eight months later, Don Peak rolls into town with Ray Charles Orchestra and we're coming up to the Coliseum, and we notice that there's barbed wire. And we notice there are guys with shotguns about every three feet. And they stop the bus. And they get on with flashlights and, and shotguns, and we're all sitting there. I'm sitting right behind Brother Ray with this guitar, like this. I'm ducking down. And Ray Charles yells, what do they want? And Jeff Brown said, they want the white boy. We heard there's a white boy traveling with this band. And Governor Wallace has said, no white people will come to the Ray Charles concert. And Brother Ray shot back right away, tell him he's Spanish. And these guys are up there going, well, I don't know if he's Spanish. Maybe he's not white. I mean, they've, and I'm holding my breath and holding my guitar. And I looked at Lily Fort, the lead singer of the Raylats, and I said, Buenas tardes, senorita. And she said, Don, what is wrong with you? And I said, See, I said, Yeah, buenas. I said, uh, You know, vamos a comer. Let's go eat. You know, and she's going, Don, are you all right? Well, the, well, the ignorant guys up in the front, decided, okay, you know, they got off the bus, they went like this. So we rolled down into the Coliseum, and traveling with us were the Fifth Dimension. So Marilyn McCoo and Fritzy Basket and Lamont McLemore and the Raylettes, they all came into the men's dressing room and put makeup on me and darkened me up 
and we went out on stage and there was this one song Ray used to play and he would it was a blues and he mm -hmm. wanted always I'd, I'd stand up and I'd play a solo mm -hmm. this night I stayed sitting down and we got the hell out of Montgomery Alabama but I believe that Ray saved my life that night mm -hmm. because those they had just killed those three boys in, in Mississippi and I believe Ray saved me that night that's an amazing well, story well what I found out 20 years later at, at Frisky's Frisky Fritzy's funeral Clarence McDonald got up and told that story and said, by the way, Don, you didn't know this, but after that you were nicknamed Julio Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the band called me from then on. <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Don. So, yeah, indeed. <laughs>